Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, the LEAD Project Series, Part 2, Certification Kickoff. For those of you that are not familiar with 3R and our relationship with SRI, I'll give you a little background. In 1996, SRI began to incorporate environmental and CSR standards, including ISO 14001. By 2006, SRI started to incorporate its own internal CSR initiatives with the goal of improving the company and work environment for its employees. In 2008, SRI Green Building Certification was established to perform lead project reviews for the U.S. Green Building Council and GBCI. After establishing a team with various backgrounds in the sustainability and built environment sectors and completing over 5,000 green building projects, 3R was spun off to provide consulting services in CSR and green buildings. I'm Carla Mitchell with 3R and I've been a lead accredited professional for 10 years. Throughout my career of more than 20 years, I've been part of the design teams for multiple LEED certified buildings. For the past eight years, I've been working as a LEED project reviewer and a consultant for SRI and 3R, overseeing a team of reviewers that have completed nearly 10,000 project phase reviews. This experience makes us uniquely qualified to have those discussions about LEED projects. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, the LEED certification process. We'll talk briefly about the lead rating systems, important lead project details that must be established at the beginning, registering your project, and understanding the minimum program requirements, or MPRs. Then we'll discuss what the differences are between campus and multiple building projects, using lead online, documenting your project strat strategies, and finally, the lead review process. And lastly, we'll touch on some resources that are available to you and your team. So the LEED certification process includes five main phases of work. First, you have to identify your rating system. Then you register your project, submit your documentation for review. The project is then under review by GBCI. And finally, you get certified. Within those first four phases of work, there are multiple things that are important to know in order to have your LEED project go smoothly. So when you decide to pursue certification, you must first pick the appropriate rating system, and LEED can apply at any scale. There's Building Design and Construction, or BDNC, which applies to new buildings or buildings that are getting a major renovation, Interior Design and Construction, or IDNC, which applies to interior fit-out projects, Operations and Management, or O&M, which works for any existing building that is fully operational and occupied, even without any renovation work planned, Neighborhood Development, or ND, which is for land development projects. Homes is for residential buildings, including single family and multifamily structures. And cities and communities, which will highlight the sustainability and resiliency of entire cities or subsections of a city. So once you've chosen the rating system, there are specific pathways within the IDNC, O&M, and BDNC rating systems that are suited for specific building types like retail, hospitality, or healthcare. While some adaptations are required for your building type, others can provide you an advantage to a project because the lead requirements are tailored to your building's specific use and occupancy. So now that you've chosen the appropriate rating system, there is some information that must be established at the beginning of your lead project. First, determine your lead project boundary. This should include all things that are within the scope of work of your project. You must report your areas, both the total building area and site area. Establish your project occupancy. This will include full-time equivalents or FTEs, transients, residents, and any other occupants that make up your peak and daily average values. You'll then need to put together a package of information that includes drawings like floor plans, mechanical plans, mechanical schedules, and a site plan showing your lead project boundary. You should also report the space usage types in the project. This will help avoid confusion by your reviewer. And lastly, you should include a clear, detailed narrative. The narrative should provide an explanation of any things in your project that may be unclear to someone who is unfamiliar with the project. The narrative can also include explanations of any special circumstances, details of any complicated systems, or merely be a detailed written description of the scope of work. 
And the most important thing to remember as you get started with your lead project is that this information should be reported consistently across all submittal documentation. Many review comments are generated due to a lack of clear details and by the details being reported differently in each credit. Okay, so let's get into the minimum program requirements or the MPRs. Every lead project must meet the minimum program requirements as defined by the lead rating system. These requirements are foundational to all lead projects and define the projects that are the lead rating system is designed to evaluate. There are three MPRs. Must be in a permanent location on existing land, must use a reasonable lead boundary, and you must comply with the project size requirements. On the following slides, I've outlined the intent, requirements, and some additional guidance for each one of these. So the first MPR is that the building must be a, in a permanent location on existing land. You know, this mandates that the project is not designed to move at any point in its lifetime. So movable buildings are not eligible for certification, and an example of this would be a construction trailer. On the other hand, prefab or modular buildings can qualify once they're permanently in place on their site. The next NPR is that the project must use a reasonable lead boundary. The boundary must include the full scope of work and the entire building. Your boundary can include parking structures that serve your project, but cannot include only structures dedicated to parking. If you have more than one structure that is physically connected to another within your boundary, that would be considered one building for lead purposes, provided that connection is programmable space. A hallway or corridor does not constitute programmable space. And multiple buildings without that programmable space connection are considered separate buildings and would need to be individual lead projects. But in this case, you could also do a multiple building project, which we'll, just, we'll discuss in just a bit. So the last NPR is pretty straightforward. Your building must be a minimum of 1,000 square feet for BDNC and O&M projects. But if you're pursuing the IDNC rating system, your project must be at least 250 square feet. So like I promised, we're going to talk a bit about multiple building projects called groups, as well as campuses and blocks. There are three ways of registering projects that are either related or located on the same campus. These are a block registration, a campus registration, and a group project registration. All three of these options are available for multiple buildings or spaces that are located on a single site. Let's start with the block and campus projects. If you have multiple related lead projects, you can register a block with the GBCI. This block won't receive a certification or affect how you submit your projects, but it does identify your projects as related to GBCI so that they can keep those projects together with the same reviewer. Keeping related projects with the same reviewer will help ensure consistency throughout the review of all of your projects. If you have multiple separate buildings that are located on the same site or campus, you can register a campus project and complete a master site project. This master site is where you may document credits that apply to all of the related projects. There are multiple credits that can be documented under the master site, but performance-based credits and prerequisites like EA prerequisite minimum energy performance or WE credit water use reduction must be documented under the individual projects. Once credits are awarded in the master site, those credits can then be claimed by all individual lead projects associated with the master site. Going this route saves time in documenting credits or strategies that would normally have to be duplicated across multiple projects. So if you have a project that includes multiple separate buildings, you must register them either individually or as a group. The group approach simplifies the documentation for projects and multiple buildings. If you register a group, all of the buildings will be located within a single lead project boundary and have a single lead registration. Credits will be documented as a single building. However, all performance-based credits and prerequisites, like water and energy, must demonstrate compliance for each building of the group individually. And once through the review process, the group of build buildings will then receive a single lead rating and certification. Now we'll take a look at Lead Online. You can find it at lo.usgbc.org, as shown on the screen. 
And if you have any problems using Lead Online, you can check your system requirements by clicking on the link below the login button. The red arrow on the screen is pointing to that link. This will open a window that will give you information about the tools on your computer that are used in Lead Online. And that's the graphics shown on the right. So just a little tip, don't use Chrome as your browser. Chrome and Lead Online don't get along very well and you will incur problems like forms not opening. So this makes the process a little tedious, so plan ahead and use Internet Explorer or Firefox. So once you're in Lead Online, this is your dashboard, and this is where you'll upload your project documentation when you're ready to submit for review. All of your lead projects and project uh, information and documentation will be accessed from this page. And the red arrow on the right is showing you the button to click to start your project registration. After clicking that button, you'll see a screen as shown on the left, and this is what the project registration form looks like. In order to register your project, you'll need some basic information. You'll need the project name, the rating system you want to register, the anticipated project start and end dates, total square footage, the project owner, and the project address that are all required inputs for your registration. You can also designate your project as private or public. Choosing public will allow USGBC to publish some details of your project along with your final lead scorecard. So as part of registration, there are fees, and the fee structure is uh, for a project is made up of registration and certification fees. So registration is the standard fee that will be discounted if the person registering your project is a USGBC silver, gold, or platinum member, and this is paid at the time you register your project. Currently, the registration is either $1,500 or $1,200 for USGBC members. Then the certification fees are determined based on the square footage of your project using a cost per square foot with a minimum fee for each size threshold. For example, a 250,000 square foot building would be charged 55 cents per square foot for a total of $13,750. However, in this instance, the minimum fee of $14,250 would be imposed. And those certification fees just need to be paid at the time you submit your project for preliminary review. So now you've identified the right rating system and you've gotten your project registered. So the next steps are putting together your project team. Your team can be made up of professionals from your company or outside consultants. However, one requirement for the team is that every project includes a lead accredited professional who specializes in the rating system you're registered under and who will be actively involved in the project. Next, you should identify the lead project goals, including your desired level of certification. Then you document your project and finally upload all documentation to Lead Online. So as we mentioned in the last slide, one part and probably the biggest part of this process is documenting your project. The first thing you should do when outlining your strategies and beginning in the documentation process is to complete a lead checklist. These checklists are available at usgbc.org and they're helpful for determining the number of points you plan to pursue. The checklist should be a living document until you get through your final review phase so that points can be tallied and strategies can be added or changed based on your set certification goal. After you get your checklist together, you'll need to compile the necessary information. You will attempt the credits and prerequisites in Lead Online as noted in your checklist. Then your team will need to document the project strategies. This will be in the form of calculations, drawings, and narratives, along with the lead forms for each credit and any required documentation as outlined in the lead reference guide. So documenting your project strategies is not as daunting as it may seem. There are most likely a lot of things that you're already planning to do in your building that will meet the requirements of many of the prereqs and credits. For example, if your design includes all LED lighting, you can take credit for the energy savings in your energy model, as well as attempt an innovation strategy for low mercury lighting that can earn you one point. In addition, most people recycle. That's a normal part of your everyday life now. By planning for recycling of specific materials and allotting space for the storage of your recyclables, you are meeting the intent of the prerequisite 
MR storage of collection of recyclables. And it's just as easy as that. When the lead project documentation stage is complete, your project goes through a third party review by GBCI. And the process is shown here on the left. You submit your project for preliminary review. The project is in review with GBCI for approximately 25 business days. The project then gets returned to you and you have then 25 business days to have your team address any outstanding issues. You then submit for final review and that review process is repeated. Overall, the review process can be as short as three months, depending on how well your project is documented and how quickly your team addresses any review comments. However, there are a number of things that can extend that timeline on your review. So establishing a schedule for your project goal is key, especially if certification is required for any part of your project. Once the review is complete, you can accept the results of the review or start the appeal process to address any denied credits or attempt additional points as needed. After accepting your review, your project will be declared as certified to the appropriate level based on the number of awarded points. And the last step is hanging your plaque. So we've talked exclusively about LEED today, but there are other rating systems as well which pursue different goals like Living Building Challenge, Well, Passive House, and Bream. While the end goal may be different, using any of these rating systems will serve to document and confirm your building's sustainability pursuits. And every project is different. And while LEED can accommodate most project types, it doesn't fit every project. So you may be interested in pursuing a different rating system. If that's the case, give me a call and I'd be happy to help you uh, talk about your particular situation and which rating system is right for you. SRI and 3R have the experience with the process and the skills needed to help companies be successful in the pursuit of their sustainability goals. And if you're not considering certification, but want to design or improve your building to get maximum benefits, we can help with that too. Although I must say there is a lot of brand value to be realized from having that plaque and what it stands for, so I would highly encourage you to consider certification if at all possible. When you're pursuing LEED certification, you can call us to help. At the very least, make sure you involve someone who can look at your situation and provide a realistic assessment of how you should pursue your LEED certification. With the right partners on your team, LEED certification can be easy and beneficial both for your financial and environmental commitments. Of course, if we can help in any other way, we've listed some of our other 3R CSR and built environment services here. I'd like to thank you for attending the LEED Project Series Part 2 Certification Kickoff, and please look for the rest of the series available in the coming weeks where we'll dive into the details of each LEED credit category.